this long oil sands boom, which has lasted the better part of 15 years, is coming to an end because the price of oil has flatlined. Investment on new projects has completely collapsed. Since Suncor's Foothills mine came online, that's the last mega project we will see in the oil industry, probably ever. The Americans have basically invented new technology, fracking and horizontal drilling. The United States is now producing more oil than Middle Eastern countries. The result is that the market is being flooded with oil. That's the reason that the price of oil has collapsed. The government now doesn't have the same level of, of resource revenue coming in, and our tax base isn't substantial enough to actually run our core services. Alberta's, for the longest time, had uh a labor shortage due to the you know, economic upswing with the, the high oil prices, high natural gas prices. Now with the economic downturn, there's actually a labor surplus. Our oil industry has shed over 50,000 jobs. Only about a third of those have come back with the slight price rebound. And so about 30, 35,000 former oil and gas workers, those jobs simply don't exist anymore. For those workers, there was no plan. 9,000 oil and gas workers in Edmonton don't have jobs still three years later. We have to be able to strategize and, and bring this into a, a planned um, change, you know, a transition that is what we call it, a just transition, where people and communities are going to be taken care of. I think if there really was a just transition for Indigenous people, we would have a say in the development that's happening around us. Because right now we're not even at the table. The Athabasca River and the Delta and their water systems there have been very damaged by the oil and gas industry. They can't even hunt and fish anymore. They have high rates of cancer. For me, it has more to do with our, our rights to the land and our rights to maintain our culture and our rights to clean water. I am a member of Big Stone Cree Nation, which is in Treaty 8 territory. Within Alberta, we have three treaties, Treaty 6, 7, and 8. They signed our treaty because the government found out that there was oil and gas resources in this region. The way the government divided us by different First Nations and by putting us on reserve land really divided us as a people. and and really limited the amount of land we could use for things like hunting and fishing and subsistence and uh, it just cutting us off from our vast territory really just cuts us off from our culture. To Indigenous people you can't own the land. We are connected to the land. Our culture is in the land. Our language comes from the land. Our medicines come from the land. Our food comes from the land and our water comes from the land. This is who we are as Indigenous people. After the reserve system was set in place, then they started the residential schools of taking our children away and trying to take the Indian out of the child, which basically meant take away our culture, physically and emotionally and sexually abused and facing neglect. If you can imagine what happened to that community once the children were gone, the women, I believe, imploded. I mean, they were taken, the children were taken away from their mothers. The children then were put in institutions that didn't show them any love or caring. Not only were they segregated from their parents, but they were segregated from their siblings while they were in school. And parents needed permission to see their kids in the summertime. You're not allowed to speak your language or do, you know, do anything that you were doing previously with your parents before you got taken away stolen away. How are you supposed to learn how to be a mother? How are you supposed to learn how to love? That's what you call the residential school syndrome, is it just, you don't learn these things. So, so how are you able to teach your children? The last residential school closed in 1996. In various forms that is continued. They only changed the names, like now it's the social services where they take away the children. The state worked with the church to basically commit cultural genocide on our people. If they could control the Indian and kill the Indian, then they could get all the resources that they want.
The oil industry came to Alberta after 1947. Suddenly, instead of a fairly progressive province, we became a right-wing oil province. I'm standing with my back to the Strathcona, the Edmonton Strathcona refinery, just outside of the Edmonton city limits, so they don't have to pay any of the Edmonton taxes. That's pretty typical of what the oil industry does in these communities. This refinery belongs to Imperial Esso, one of seven or eight companies that devolved from Standard Oil that was owned by the Rockefeller family. They brought their style of uh, industrial organization to Alberta, and Alberta to this day is the province in Canada that has the lowest rate of unionization. This mm. plant here actually is unionized. It's a part of the huge Unifor local. The Canadian oil and gas industry employs about 180,000 workers, which is only about 1% of Canada's total workforce. Most of those jobs are in oil sands, and the oil sands are about 2% of our national economy. The first oil sands plant opened in Fort McMurray in 1968. Well until the end of the 90s, the oil sands was a very marginal industry. The oil doesn't flow freely. It is literally oil in sand, and so it has to be upgraded. The costs were very high and they only made sense because the governments of the day put public money into those projects. In 2004, the price of oil went through the roof. Conventional oil was drying up and it started to make sense to invest in the oil sands. Literally every oil company, major oil company around the world who had been ignoring us for decades, they started you know, beating a path to Alberta's door and governments here in Alberta provided them incentives. Those incentives didn't actually have to be made. What brought the investment was the increase in the price of oil. So we gave literally billions away that could have been used for things like uh, healthcare, education, public infrastructure. What it did do, however, was create a lot of employment. In order to get the oil sands out of the ground, these big companies had to build big industrial projects. They were also doing them all at the same time. And so what the result was, was that there is a, a dramatic bidding up in terms of the wages, in some cases double here uh, than they were elsewhere. So what ended up happening is all kinds of people from elsewhere in Canada, elsewhere in the world, started moving to Alberta to work these uh, oil and gas jobs, which are uh, very well paying. You know, you can make 150 or $200,000 a year. The two pioneering companies in the oil sands were Suncor on one hand, and Syncrude on the other. Suncor has been unionized almost from the beginning, but Syncrude has been non-union. At Suncor, we bargained collective agreements and the others followed suit. Syncrude would, um, you know, give the same wages um, and benefits, making sure that uh, they didn't give the union too much of an opening to come in and organize their workers. And then the same thing around the other plants that have come and set up shop afterwards. Alberta's population doubled. The government couldn't keep up with building schools, building roads, building new houses for these workers who moved to Alberta because why would a construction worker work on building a house when they could go to the oil industry and make 200 grand a year? A number of workers in the oil industry in Alberta are fly in, fly out. They don't actually live in Alberta. They live, you know, in BC or Ontario or wherever, and they fly in for a couple weeks. They work really long hours, and then they fly home, you know, for a week or two. And it's it's really hard labor. You know, the stories you hear from those workers, the studies that have been done, uh, they're going home, and they need a few days for their body just to physically recover. When I was working out in the mine, the schedule that I was on was six, six days on, six days off. The first three days, get up about 5.30 in the morning and go out and wait for the bus in the cold. By the time you get on your actual equipment, it's, a, it's about 8 o'clock. And then you work your 12-hour shift back on that bus, so you're actually not home till about 9 o'clock at night. So a lot of people, they try to stay up as late as they possibly can because the next day they have to go in for night shift for eight o'clock that night and then not home until nine in the morning. They fly in, they stay in this uh, temporary work facility, we usually call it a, a workers camp. It's very hard to leave your family, your friends, everything behind for 20 days, uh, go out into the middle of nowhere, do your job, know that there's things going on at home that you can't do anything about or you're not able to do anything about. They, everybody has their everybody has their life, mm -hmm. but ours is pretty much torn apart. My community continues to have a high level of unemployment. Many of the men from my community are 
are basically stuck in precarious, unskilled work. They end up getting the labor jobs. I tell this story about Mike Woodward, who's from Anzac. He went to get employed at Syncrude on construction, and they said no, no they, were, they didn't need him. And then he went, he thought, I'm going to get on that job. So he went back, and he said he was Mexican. He got hired right away. Indigenous women do have a higher rate of educational attainment. So a lot of Indigenous women actually work in the public sector and do very well for themselves there. But the women that choose to work in the private sector, uh, in my community, um, the ones that I interviewed ended up working in administrative support in the oil industry or working in the work camps as cooks or cleaning staff or administrative staff. 3% of us are First Nations, Inuit, Métis out at camp and that's that's unacceptable. They are on our land, so they should be employing us. For a long time, I was stuck in the dish pit. I couldn't take the schedule. It was from 4 p.m. till 2.30 a.m. or something like that. We already have that stereotype as a drunken Indian, dirty Indian. I even had one of my coworkers say that to me, like, you know, when all you when all you Indians come, we thought, oh boy, now the camp is going down. We're gonna have a dirty place. This is, you know, they're disgusting. And so that's why I thought, hey, I'm gonna become chef. I'm gonna work my way up. But there wasn't that opportunity, and there still really isn't that opportunity. In order to make any progress and to be a leader for my people, I had to become a shop steward. Having the union behind me, they started listening. Where my First Nation is located is near the Athabasca oil sands deposit. The processes that they use to extract oil require a great deal of water. And my people don't even have access to water lines to have drinkable water. We're losing many of our fur-bearing animals. Some of the hunters have found moose with cancers, which was rarely found before, which is one of our main sources of protein. They found two-headed fish fish with cancers. Indigenous women historically have been very devalued um, and there's a lot of violence against our women. And then you bring in an industry that's primarily young men who work in very stressful situations and there's a lot of drugs and alcohol. Um, it just normalizes the violence. I think that's why right now we have a lot of murdered and missing Indigenous women. I belong to Athabasca Chippewan First Nations. They get pissed off at you because you work at Suncor, right? And how could you work there? So it makes it hard that way. An elder said to us a long time ago, we used to die of old age and now we die of cancer, you know? And that hits home for me because as First Nations people, we honor our elders. I can't trash this dirty oil. I can't really say it because I work here. I made a living here. I made a good living here. I took care of my girl really good. That kid's never gone without anything. She doesn't know what a slop pail is <laughs> and a wood stove. You know what I mean? Like, she has everything that I never had growing up. I'm not against my people. I am working for my children. I'm going to make sure that they're not a part of that residential cycle. I want to make sure they break out of it. They see their mother working. They are going to be in my footsteps and they are going to make sure that their children are well taken care of also. There's five companies that produce 80% of the tar sands. They will continue to make a profit in the coming years and even decades. The oil sands right now is producing about two and a half million barrels a day. The expectation from industry as well as our government is that will increase by almost 50% between now and 2030. So those five companies 
are at a point now where their facilities are already cash cows. They just need to maintain them and, and perhaps build them out a bit over time. What they're concerned about is growing their production at the same time as reducing their workforce. Big oil is making the money, playing with people's livelihood constantly until they get a shortage of workers. Well, and now we get into temporary foreign worker program where it's totally starting to get abused very badly by companies just bringing people in without following the guidelines that are set. The industry is known in situ production is, is the future of the industry since 1995. which uses natural gas to heat up water into steam, to pump the steam underground. You heat up the bitumen, you suck the bitumen back up through a different pipe. It costs way less to produce. And to produce the facility initially, and then to maintain the facility over time and produce the oil, requires almost no workers, in fact. They're importing self-driving 300 ton trucks that haul the tar sands into the refinery where it's broken down into bitumen. They're finding new ways of getting rid of people. We have one big drilling company called Precision Drilling and they're in the process of moving towards drilling platforms that will be entirely unmanned. It'll be operated by one or two people with gaming boards and stuff working from an office in you know Calgary or heck maybe even Houston. A drilling platform would usually have between 15 and 20 people. So we're talking about a transformation of the industry that's already in the process of eliminating hundreds and thousands of jobs. So the conversation that we're starting to have here in Alberta is a conversation about transition. The other factor that's affecting this energy transition is uh, the, you know the concern about uh, climate change and, and global warming. The science is clear. The climate is changing. That change is being driven by the combustion of fossil fuels. About 60 to 70 percent of our workforce uh, works in the oil and gas industry. We teach the electrical vehicle charging station, introductory to photovoltaics, solar installation, and solar design. We knew that we already could supply them with the skilled workforce that they required. Uh, what we couldn't give them was the, the rates that they needed to be at. There's a lot more people that are willing to do the work, probably because it's a little bit more clean and it's closer to home. Well, if you have a larger labor pool, unfortunately it drives wages down, right? Do I think that this person's going to make the exact same wage that they made in the oil and gas industry? No. But we can't just look across at that building and see somebody putting solar panels up and go, well, that's a good green job. Far too often in this country, they don't go up and ask that worker, what are you making for a wage? Do you have a pension plan? Do you have benefits? But we have to include into this renewable energy plan, a plan for that worker so that one day he can retire comfortably. He can make a wage that is high enough that he can support his family and he's not living a life in poverty. In our ambition to fight climate change, we can't be doing it on the backs of workers. The Unifor local up in Fort McMurray in the tar sands, what they call the oil sands, is actually the local in Alberta that has passed perhaps the strongest uh, resolution talking about the need to get away from total dependence on oil and starting to provide for our needs through other sources. My members are feeling guilty to work in the oil sands. We know that what we're doing is, is uh, you know, destructive to the environment. We know that industry is not doing enough. We know that government's not doing enough. But yet we enjoy the work. You know, it's a good living for all of us, so nobody wants to give that up either. And so what we're looking for is a position that we can say, yes, we can be on that side. We know that we can't just turn the valve off today because we are still quite dependent on, on fossil fuels for energy. While we're doing that transition to a different kind of energy, we should have that reserve uh, so we can keep our home fueled as we're doing that transition. We say that we have to have um, all the people at the table to talk about a strategy for oil and energy. We need to have the First Nations people that are being affected by the destruction of their lands. We need to have the environmentalists there, no question. We need to have industry, we need to have labor, we need to have government. We need to put a strategy together. The government is liable now for a cleanup of a thousand of those sites that have been left behind and communities devastated uh, because uh, we have no strategy to deal with it. We're seeing it in forestry, living it today. We saw it in fisheries. People are still 
in the same situation that uh, they were 20 years ago when they abandoned the fisheries on the East Coast and we're going to see it on the West Coast here shortly. We have no strategy, no plan and we just let the markets get us to a point of devastation and then, you know, we're in a catastrophe. When the government of Alberta announced that they were going to phase out coal-fired electricity uh, by 2030, they made the announcement initially in, in 2015. They didn't have a plan for transitioning these workers and communities. They made these workers wait 18 months to hear what the plan was. When they announced the plan, it was literally the same week that layoffs started happening. Companies invested a large chunk of money in a power plant. They have a license that says they can run that till 2050 something and the government comes in and says, no, no, you gotta shut it down early. They negotiated and got a chunk of change that uh, for our employer is about 40 million a year through till 2030, so they get an annual payment. Uh, the other companies have similar amounts. The power plants, in addition, made a deal with the federal government to get an extra 10 years of licensing added to their operating permits for the plants by changing them from coal to natural gas. So they were able to take the money for going off coal, put it into getting off coal even quicker, and have a natural gas unit that turns on and off much quicker than a coal unit. And those are the same corporations that are going to continue to, to, to supply Alberta with electricity just through, through uh, gas and in some cases they own wind and solar facilities. They're not being asked to pay into transition funds for workers, for communities. The compensation that's offered is a bit of a top up on your unemployment insurance for 45 weeks. $5,000 relocation allowance if you have to move to find another job and $12,000 education voucher that you can use after you're laid off. That little bit versus the billion plus the uh, employers got uh, isn't a very just transition. I have put in 30 years plus at the mine. I'm only 48 years old and my trigger point is 60 to collect my pension. I am going to be five years short of my pension which means I take a great hit uh, uh, percentage-wise because I didn't hit my age. All I have is the job. I don't have anything to back up. I'm 53 next month. Nobody wants to hire somebody my age. That's the problem I've got. I'm not going to make retirement because I've only got me 12 years in. I was hoping to stay at least till 61 to get my 20 years in. Then I'd be able to retire. There's no way I'm going to do that now. We want to make the uh, planet a better place and uh, fight global warming, but in the process we're gutting the skilled workforces we have here. When we talk about transition, if we're going to do it, who's going to do the work to actually transition away from oil and coal-fired electricity? And what work is that? There are literally tens of thousands of jobs to do cleanup work, to build renewables, way more jobs than there is in Canada's oil and gas industry now. The major factor in us actually meeting our climate targets is going to have to be government intervention in the economy. There's no other way around it.